uh, Jess will also let you know when to stop. Okay, I have the link. Will I post in the Discord? I'm mid message, so do you want to chuck it to me and I'll put it up? Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay, um, so hi everyone, my name is Jess and I'm going to start out with a bit of a discussion about prioritizing material at opening and also turf burning and then I understand we will be um, passing over to Benjamin to discuss uh, a bit of the same and then uh, we will have some Q&As. So um, people who are watching, you're very welcome to leave any questions on the Facebook stream and we will then address them afterwards. So. The way I'm going to do this is more or less just to go through a series of tips as to how I think you can best prioritize material at opening and also do so in a way that I guess uh, the ultimate aim is to close off uh, closing half teams from being able to extend over you, but also to, I guess, uh, meaningfully preempt what the team on your diagonal might run. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that frustratingly, when it comes to this discussion, there is no perfect right or wrong answer. There is no optimal number of arguments you ought run at front half. Um, and it is a trade off. Obviously, if you're going to run several arguments, you are potentially doing so at the expense of quality. That is, if you're shoving and packing four or five arguments in, in a, a top half case, um, the risk that you're running, of course, is that you're under-analyzing parts of that case in an attempt to run many arguments. 
And then the risk of that, of course, is that what your closing might do is come in and better mechanize or characterize or impact something that you've left and then kind of weigh that as the most important thing in the debate. And then they beat you as a result. Obviously, on the other hand, if you uh, only focus your case a bit too shallowly, it is equally possible for a closing team to come in and then do a very similar thing. So it leaves the, the, the question of um, how do I, how do I balance this? And I think the ultimate answer is that you have to do what is within your strengths and what you are capable of doing and have a, I guess, a firm recognition of what's the case whilst also making sure you're doing other things like weighing your material, firmly mechanizing your material, et cetera. So I think the first thing to say with that in mind is, as I kind of alluded to, know what your strengths are. So if you're a speaker that knows every time you speak fast, you tend to miss links, you tend to underanalyze, don't be the sort of person that then runs uh, four or five arguments because you're probably going to do that poorly. Um, conversely, if you know that weighing is a big strength of yours, then you can probably get away with running two or three solid arguments and then just deeply weighing that. In particular, I know of a lot of um, ESL speakers who have told me that they do find it difficult to keep up with kind of like the current meta of, you know, I say current meta, quote unquote, um, of, you know, turf burning and dumping four or five arguments. But what they are very good at, and this is what they've self-identified themselves, is uh, weighing material really well and just focusing on a couple of things and making that really important in the debate. Um, if you are fine at turf burning and you think you can do so in a way that doesn't jeopardize quality and isn't at such an incomprehensible speed that you will not be understood, then that is something that you can indeed do. Um, but I think what you have to do is very firmly pay attention to the feedback you're getting about whether stuff that you're running is discernible to judges. So that's a very basic tip, but I think something that's worthwhile keeping in mind. Another thing I would say when deciding the amount of arguments to run at opening is to ask yourself this question. Is this argument debate winning? And I know that sounds very obvious, but it is not a question that I think debaters ask themselves a lot. Because for example, say you're a deputy and you wanna run an additional substantive point. Um, is that point likely to be picked up by a closing team at extension and could win the debate? If you don't think it is likely to do that, that's not to say that you drop the claim completely, but it may not be worth running in that context because if your primary goal for running that, that, that point is to close off back half, but you don't conceptualize a world where back half could utilize that argument to win the debate, just because you yourself perceive it as relatively unimportant, then the relative value of running it is probably minimal. Sure, you're looking like you're running additional content, but maybe there's a trade-off that you're making there in terms of rebuilding your material or um, you know, re rebutting the other team or something like that. So that is kind of the test that I try to use is, is this actually going to be that strategic in winning the debate or am I just running it because I want to have an additional argument? So that's one thing to say. I think the next thing to say is be very conscious of your team dynamic. So I mean this in two ways. The first is, to be complementary with one another. So if you know that your you know, prime minister speaker, say, or say your prime minister, is running lots of different arguments, very well mechanized and well characterized, but is not very conscious of weighing, then that is probably something that a deputy should focus on more. It helps very little, I think, to do the same role at front half. And I, again, I know this sounds fairly obvious, but I think you need to be um, specifically mindful of what you're going to cover. And sometimes that looks like deputies just kind of vibing what their first speaker said and then kind of filling in the rest. But sometimes that leaves a little bit too much to be adapted to you know, what has happened to the debate itself. Um, rather, I think it can actually be mindful to have strategic conversations with your partner um, before a tournament or before a debate to be explicit about what you're going to focus on. Obviously, with a degree of adaptability, uh, having to change as the debate transpires. But I think um, that way you're not going to be like, oh, well, I, you rebutted. No, I, I was going to rebut. Like, what, you know, like you, you'll never get as many of those conversations. And I think what, what that helps to do is just ensure that you are meaningfully diversifying the content that you have at front half 
um, and not focusing too much about the same on the same thing. So I think with teamwork, it's a balance of you obviously want to have material that complements one another, but if you're kind of talking about the same thing or you're fulfilling the same roles or you're both weighing on the same mechanisms um, in both speeches, it's probably not the most efficient use of your time. The other thing to say on teamwork is to recognize the relative strengths and weaknesses of you. Um, and I know this can sometimes be a bit of an uncomfortable conversation to have in the context of like, you know, pro-amming, not everyone wants to necessarily recognize that they might be speaking with a stronger partner, for example. But I think being especially conscious of this um, and having kind of, you know, honest conversations can sometimes be useful. Um, what, I, what I mean by that is um, if, for example, you know that your partner is relatively new, and may miss some links in their, for example, first speaker speech, it could be useful in that context to, I guess, be especially aware of that, knowing that you might have to dedicate some time to rebuilding at second, the trade-off there being perhaps more rebuttal or more weighing. So all of this is just to say, be, be conscious of it, um, because I think uh, where you're not, you can kind of miss things that you wouldn't have otherwise picked up on. And, that can also be a useful part of feeding into the conversation about what you're each going to cover. Um, so, okay, I might need to leave a bit of time for rebuilding. So you need to make sure that you've included some weighing in your speech, for example. Um, all of this, again, to serve the purpose of making sure that your case is as strong as possible at opening um, so that you're leaving as little room as possible for closing teams to extend. The next thing then, to say is, uh, I've, I've mentioned weighing a few times. What do I what do I mean by that? And how do you weigh at front half? Um, one of the things I like to do is just to flag very explicitly. Now I'm going to weigh our case against preemptively against back half or against the other teams. You don't have to use that language, but it's about explicitly flagging that you're going to weigh your material. A lot of teams don't think they need to weigh their material at, at front half, and you don't need to. There's no need to do anything but it is one tool that you can utilize to potentially make it more difficult for closing teams to respond to, uh, to, to extend on you um, and the benefit is that you're not only explaining the importance of your material but you're giving a metric for the debate and then closing in their weighing have to explain why their metric is more important. So if you've done a lot of weighing about how this impacts very vulnerable groups and this ought be very important yada 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 and say closing team have an impact which they think is bigger on a, on a larger scale, then they have to explain why that is actually indeed the, the more important metric in the debate. They can't just say, oh, we win because we have a larger impact. They have to explain proactively why their metric is more important than your metric. So you've, you've, you've I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? You've given a, a larger onus on closing teams to do that. Um, so that is indeed the benefit, I think, of weighing at front half. And you can kind of do so on any metric that you choose. Um, but I think just dedicating a portion of time to that can be a useful way of um, also prioritizing your material. Um, with that said, there's always limited time in the debate and or limited time in the speech. And you're probably thinking, like, what is important? What is not important to run? Um, as I said, like, it's, it's impossible to tell people specifically like how many arguments they can run what they all cut however I do think there are a set of common things that people could probably deprioritize to some extent if they would like to fit in additional argumentation um, I think the first thing is like long-winded introductions I think whilst introductions I'm not saying to do away with them entirely because they can be a useful way to engage judges to make a point very firmly from the start, to you know, captivate audiences. At the same time, you have to ask yourself what that, uh, that introduction is serving um, and does it need to perhaps be as long as I might be doing ordinarily? So that is one way that you could perhaps improve a degree of efficiency. The next thing is kind of like characterization and setup. I find a lot of teams do characterization in the sort of abstract and they don't link it to any specific arguments. So whilst it's perfectly fine to do some initial setup and then move into arguments, one way that I think teams can become a little bit more efficient is perhaps seeing the way in which they could integrate that characterization into their argument set. So you're forcing yourself to be very clear about, is this characterization actually proving something or am I just characterizing 
for the sake of characterizing, is this something that I could perhaps cut uh, in the debate? And the other thing that I think you can consider reducing if you need to is just the amount of mechanisms that you have. That is not to say that you should not have a case that is rigorous with mechanisms. Of course you should, and of course they're important. But at some point you have to question whether the, the like fourth or fifth mechanism that's proving the same argument uh, is indeed relatively utile. Um, so that's not to say to not have it, but if there's a trade-off and you think that you know, consistent feedback you're getting is you're really under impacting something uh, and you need to spend a bit of time on that, then consider maybe I ought to drop this, you know, fourth mechanism for why this thing is true and then I can fit in a bit more impacting as a result. Um, so those are just a, a group of things that I think are often over prioritized and that's not to say you should absolutely cut them in all circumstances, but they are things that I think you can think about doing. Um, a couple of final tips and then I'll hand over um, to Benjamin. I think the first thing is obviously, um, the, sorry, I think the next thing to say is that if you've run quite a broad case at opening, it's very, very common that that material gets sort of forgotten later in the debate. And it is, um, you know, a very, very common occurrence that closing teams will be like, um, you know, try to reduce your case to like the one or two arguments you made earlier in your speech, but maybe there was actually a really important um, piece of material that you had at five minutes 30 in your PM speech or in your deputy speech that you think is actually quite important in the debate and is not being um, kind of engaged with or responded to. Um, you know, you, you can utilize obviously POIs to make sure that that material remains active in the debate um, and doesn't get dropped by judges. Um, and on, 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 the, on a note of judging, I think it's really important that um, as judges, we are very conscious of both tracking that material, but not discarding it just because it happens to come up late, for example, in a speech. So it's really important that we understand that just because a point is set at six minutes doesn't mean we, we drop it and forget about it. Otherwise, speeches would be six minutes. What would be the point of having a, a seven minute speech or indeed deputy speeches? So on that note, I think it's, uh, also very important that we're mindful of um, what we're actually crediting as judges and making sure that we're not dismissing material just because, um, for example, uh, you know, back half's only focused on a certain set of materials. So that's a thing to note about judges. And also um, it's not, I guess, appropriate for us as judges to kind of insert our own biases about what we think is the correct style with respect to front half. Like if we're not big fans of turf burning and, you know, fitting lots of arguments in, um, you know, don't penalise that simply because that's not your style. Sure, if they've uh, underanalyzed a certain point, that's fine. But I think um, I just wanted to note that I think it's important to be actively conscious as judges that we're not inserting our biases there. So then the final thing I wanted to note is, um, uh, I, the final tip I wanted to give is just a point about, okay, this is all well and good, Jess. You've talked a lot about prioritising, but I'm a novice speaker and actually I find it difficult to think of material in front half, enough arguments that will actually close off on my um, back half team in the first place. So, you know, in order to get to the step of prioritizing, you need to think about what you're actually covering in the first instance. Um, for me, when I'm really struggling at opening to think of things, I try to run through a, a list of things that might help prompt my thought process around arguments. Um, and those are, first of all, is there a particular application of this debate in a certain part of the world um, that, you know, might be particularly useful? Um, you know, obviously something that people tend to analyse a fair bit is how this might take place in like less developed countries. I don't think this is the only one, but I think um, starting to have a think about how this policy might play out in places that are different to just your sort of generic Western liberal democracy, I think can be one way of further developing your argument set. The second is to think about are there any stakeholders that might have a unique kind of engagement with this particular policy or, or thing that I might be able to develop some material around? Um, that is another thing that can, I think, argument generation. The next is, is there anything that the motion type confers that might actually need some additional argument? So if it's a regrets motion, House prefers a world motion. Is there anything additionally that I can come up with um, with respect to arguments around the potential counterfactual or anything like that? And then finally, I think being very specific to look at the motion wording 
is there something that I could generate there that could help me think of an argument? So if it's a, uh, this house supports the rise of motion, often teams will, for example, just talk about the thing that is being described in the motion and is it good or bad in and of itself, but for example, may not focus a lot on what the rise of the particular thing means in particular and why that might be important. Like, is the thing, was the thing better before the rise and now it's worse after the rise or something like that. So thinking about context, stakeholders, motion types and motion wording are all things that I think um, can help kind of prompt further argument generation. Um, so those are just a handful of tips. I will now pass on to Benjamin to discuss further. Um, okay, I was trying to turn my camera on, but, but apparently I can't. So just give me a sec. I'm going to change devices. Um, here, do not freak out. Cool. Okay. Um, assuming um, audible and visible. Uh, thanks uh, a lot, Jess, and everyone here. Just, uh, I guess, as a quick uh, disclaimer, I do not feel I have the i guess same experience is just in order for me being legitimate to actually like delivering this uh workshop with just however and despite this i do believe that it is important for worlds to actually be worlds to start recognizing value in what other circuits that are not like the european or uh like the north american one uh, to give recognition to what they are doing, to understand and grow from their experiences in order to actually have uh, a circuit that that properly aims to be worlds and recognize value in diversity and all forms and styles of debate. So despite me not feeling as uh, competitive, I guess, um, to people that currently give workshops in this, in this platform, I do still believe that it is important for people like me to have these sort of spaces. Uh, Jess already covered most uh, uh, of the important things. So I'm just going to give like additional particular tips maybe to on how to work uh, on special or on particular things to, to improve during like uh, training sessions, I guess, like particular drills that are helpful for opening uh, teams. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, WD speeches because that, that's the position I do the most. I'm a whip and an extension, but in opening halves, I tend to be WD. So uh, I guess that in, when it comes to the position in your case, despite, uh, aside from what just already explained, which is like, think of the motion type, think of how this plays in the world, I would just uh, add that, uh, you need to do this systematically in your prep time. And this is done throughout dividing your prep time and recognizing how your prep time should play out depending on what team you're going to be. Uh, you're, you do these sort of like back to basic things of recognizing each word in the motion. Uh, what does this particular country do? Is this a regret or non motion, etc.? You should be able to do that in like two, three, four, five minutes frame depending on the way you prep but you should be systematically doing these things so that in order for you to properly uh, develop your arguments to the fullest potential and that only happens when you have system systematized prep time so I would encourage you to uh, get together with your partner because this works differently for every single uh, team and think of what you need to do the most do you usually 
need to think separately, if that works and you do need to think separately, then uh, ask if uh, everyone understands the motion, then think of these particular things, what, what's the motion about, what's the most important actor, what are uh, the, like the time frame in which the motion is going to occur, uh, what is going to be like the debate winning arguments, what it's up going to bring, etc. in three minutes. If working separate, if thinking separately does not work for you and you should uh, you would rather have a discussion, then start with these questions and start discussing particularly first, what is the most important actor? What is the biggest trade-off? What are the other teams going to bring, etc. But have a systematized discussion both in what you need to think of, but also in what time that's going to occur so that you have the best prep time as possible. Because especially when you have like complicated motions, we spend more time than we should like trying to figure out what this motion is going to be about, etc. And that significantly limits the amount of time we can dedicate to building the first pitch, but also like to properly uh, build the case like overall. So I would add that to the main tips. Then um, strategy is something that uh, sounds like, I don't know, like a big buzzword and it's usually maybe not that easy to, un to understand or it's not as clear what a strategy is. Uh, in general terms, I would say is uh, how your case engages with what it's stated in the round. In world schools format, for instance, is clearer. Like uh, uh, we create content style and strategy, content being like uh, the way your argument is built, like the, me the mechanism you, you give the logical prioritization, uh, the fact that we can conclude one premise from the first premise you brought, etc. The style being how you're saying things and uh, the strategy is how those things play out. How do we improve strategy? How do we improve to uh, so that our content, maybe in some regard or style, uh, contributes to the round and engages better with what everyone's saying? I would say first, uh, like consume debate. Uh, I would just be mindful. I would just like present a caveat here. It is important, and I've heard like really historically good speakers saying that debate is rather. Uh, we're not debating new things. We're just debating the same debates with different wording, like privacy against security or uh, sanctions or social movement. Should they be leaderless or not? Or should we uh, advocate for broad supportive social movements rather than having a small committed one? We're going to we're just going to change the name of the social movement. And that's it. Even when that there's some truth uh, behind that reasoning, and we are indeed debating, and we have sim similar debates really often, consuming debate should not necessarily be or not solely be like to steal mechanism and to understand how to uh, engage in a like terrorist motion, terrorism motion um, or, or so on, but uh, also just to to have tools that, you're, that you should be able to adapt to your own debate. Like if you see that a really competitive debater is doing really good POIs or that, uh, she's responding to this particular POI in a way that you like uh, found really strategic, then utilize those tools uh, in, and incorporate them to your own like debating set rather than just like copying the case that someone else is bringing. I guess, I, I believe that this is really helpful. I'm back. Um, of course, yeah. of course, um, of course, debate. Uh, we improve debate whenever we are. Uh, 
when we debate, like we have full debates, but we should also uh, be able to to develop particular skill sets, and that is something that not a lot of people do. Uh, at least in the circuit I'm, I'm most familiar with, a lot of people just train by debating, and they just do a bunch of debates. Sometimes even uh, like every day, someone judges them, and then they get feedback. That is of course going to help you to grow. But I believe that when you say in this particular debate, I'm going to give better POIs. I'm going to be better with prioritizing my material. I'm going to uh, weigh the argument better. And even when I completely sacrifice like mechanizing the argument, I just need to practice weighing. That helps and that's better because you're focusing your, uh, your debate. So that's a general recommendation, but also again, the drills. Uh, one that comes to mind for, uh, in order to develop strategy is do shorter speeches. Like if you have three, four minute speech to deliver the same amount of content, this is going to force you to prioritize your material as just as Jess was explaining, or to cut some of the words that we utilize to make or like to sound fancier, I guess. We usually um, tend to, to, to speak more, just to be more persuasive in terms of like rhetoric and stuff. When, whenever we have less time, we're probably going to cut those words. We can get used to not using them and we're still going to deliver a lot of uh, material. That is something that happens a lot, for instance, to ESL or EFL teams, given the fact that they are not as, uh, we are not as uh, used to debate in English, I guess, uh, or not as comfortable as in our uh, like primary language. Uh, we tend to think more, which makes us lose time. Therefore, we need to be more efficient. Uh, so yes, having less time to deliver your speech helps you uh, prioritize, so uh, run the drill. Uh, run drills with more than two teams per bench, like uh, with a third government or third op, because you, like there is going to be a lot of content. Also, of course, with less time. So uh, the teams at the opening, uh, opening, opening half need to prioritize a lot, but the other teams need to be like to do a lot of way to to prove why they're beating two of the uh, two other teams in the same bench. Uh, I believe that's really interesting. And even when this seems like this is better for practicing extensions, when you develop this, uh, again, this tool of uh, weighing and properly differentiating material, et cetera, that's something that you're going to be able to do uh, from your prime minister, from your DBM, which is better because that's the way in which we make sure that we're winning the round. Uh, maybe debate shallow motions, uh, especially for back half, because this helps you uh, like boost your creativity, uh, I guess, or like analyzing how you can run maybe an analysis extension out of something that is really intuitive or how you could like completely change the round or maybe some rebuttals that uh, you would run like a rebuttal extension, just like to beat OO, so on and so forth. If you debate the shallow motion and you recognize, oh, maybe this point of analysis seems intuitive, but it needed much more mechanization, or uh, maybe this was not the most important actor, maybe we could, we could have characterized this other one. Those uh, things are going to be helpful whenever you're an, an opening team because you're going to be able to recognize maybe this mechanism is, uh, uh, or this analysis is really good, not intuitive. If we bring that from the get-go, we're probably going to lessen the possibility of our uh, closing to, to extent. That might also be helpful. And also, of course, uh, as I stated, strategy is how your content is dealing with the other things presented in the debate. Uh, uh, like the meta debate, the debate of the debate, the probably the best way to improve your ability regarding meta debate and how things played out is judging. So just judge a lot so that you yourself are able to prioritize material, recognize what things are being proven, which ones are not, uh, what are opening teams doing generally speaking. So yes, just judge. That is also really helpful. When it comes to deputy speeches, 
uh, I guess some common mistakes are uh, rebutting every piece of content from the other team. Uh, again, as just stated, this idea of uh, not being able to prioritize uh, not engaging properly, like giving the they do not respond answer when they are actually responding, maybe just not directly. Um, trying to cover a lot of ground without proper construction, which of course leaves the room for an analysis extension because you make it seem as it's yours, but then your closing mechanizes it and impacts it, and then it becomes theirs if they do it properly, which should not be enough to win the round, I guess, depending on like how the round is playing out, but still you should not leave room for that to happen. Not positioning the case in the debate, really common, uh, perhaps more important in more competitive rounds and leaving room for the panel to decide what should we buy as, as panel? How do we avoid these mistakes? The first one is, uh, and these two are going to be like counterintuitive, but it makes sense. Uh, be incredibly mindful, attentive, uh, of what everyone is saying, including your partner, and be completely honest with what everyone is saying. Uh, if you listen carefully to what everyone's saying, including your partner, you're going to be able to develop better responses. This might seem obvious, but sometimes we assume that our partner is effectively saying what we thought they were going to say because we prepped together. But sometimes people get nervous. Sometimes they themselves believe that something was more important and they prioritized that. Uh, this, is, this of course can be built uh, with like the team dynamics such as just explained, but, but uh, regardless of the dynamic, if you're explicitly, if you're listening carefully to the round, then you are going to be able to recognize for instance that mechanization was uh, done well enough. Maybe you should now prioritize or uh, your partner spends a lot of time heavily weighing why your case was going to be the most important one. Despite doing this, the argument was not completely proven or their responses in the op in the other opening were really persuasive. Therefore, you need to like rebuild the other, the only way in which you're going to find out if this is true is if you uh, actively listen. The second one, which is uh, rather counterintuitive because uh, you need to be, especially if you're a deputy, you need to be able to adapt to the debate. Even if, even when you're in opening and you as an opening should let everyone else uh, debate what you are bringing to the table and under your own like metric, under your own characterization, because that's uh, first of all, like kind of how BP works, but also uh, <coughs> that's a more strategic thing to do because you are bringing uh, like the strongest case because of like your prep time and everything we've already covered that we need to identify, uh, you, you still need to be able to adapt because maybe the other team brought something that you did not think of in prep time, so on and so forth. So you need to listen in order to be able to adapt. Notwithstanding this, there are some obvious things, some obvious responses and some obvious clashes that you should be able to respond, especially if you recognize them as strong. And you can work on these things during prep time. So. Uh, at least the way I do it, I don't. Uh, this might not work for every part, uh, yeah, every, every couple, every team. Uh, whenever we're done with like prepping the first pitch, because we collectively prep uh, like the first pitch to make sure that every piece of content is there, I start working on responses to things that are obvious in order for me to enter the debate with a really thorough, uh, comparative response, I guess, that has even eaves and then recognizes best scenarios from the other team um, and so on and so forth. So you have really strong and good response to something that is going to be obvious. Of course, there's a trade-off here because if that argument or that uh, particular thing is not brought into the debate, you only uh, lost time that could have been utilized in doing something else. So of course, recognize that this is that might be risky, but again, this tends to happen with things that are obvious, that are likely to be brought in the debate. And you do not need to explicitly report like this, the exact wording of what the other team is going to bring. If the other team is going to talk about, uh, I don't know, international leg legitimacy and how we uh, have less support of the international community whenever we do this, and they frame it this way, and you only thought about the lack of support, well, you are responding to the core of the idea you should only adapt like a few responses towards the wording 
So these, again, might be helpful uh, so that you don't have to lose time writing your response then because this lessens the, capa the, um, the capability you have to listen to what someone else is saying or to write uh, like the trade-off or the weighing. So yes, I guess this is uh, something that is useful. Uh, again, flagging, but this was already covered, so I'm not going to touch upon that, but it is, it is particularly important. And uh, of course, weighing a lot. Uh, you in the, the, in the like deputy speeches need to position your case strategically, meaning to, to say, what is your case doing? It's not only saying uh, our case is about happiness. Happiness is the most important thing in the round, but how is your case contributing to the happiness metric? What is explicitly that is doing? So uh, for explaining that the individual is indeed going to have uh, or to be more happy. You need to be explicit on how, what is it that you're doing towards that particular metric and how, how, why is that like the most important thing in the debate? You need to do both things because otherwise it is easy and this happens a lot for closing teams to say, our opening already talked about uh, happiness, but the true debate was about uh, like self-realization. No, I, that happened in the ESL quarterfinals of uh, Thailand Worlds or in the North American University's debating championship. The semifinals was about like sanctioning uh, and uh, like reducing interest rates after the two, 2008 crisis. Opening government talked about uh, like the sanctions and then closing government talked about like the interest rates in that particular debate, given the fact that it was like an out round, it was irrelevant who won the debate, but had that been the final or had that been a normal round, I believe that CG would have probably won uh, ma mainly because OG did not explain why sanctions were the most important things or why like uh, country is explicitly saying why justice and how prosecuting them was more important for individuals than their, than their monetary well-being was most important for X, Y, Z reason. So be explicit to why is it that you're saying the most important thing, utilizing the tools that I uh, just already covered in the previous discussion. A uh, particular tip to improve uh, like deputy speeches, I would say, uh, again, maybe consume debate in this particular thing, engage in debates. Like if there is a really competitive opening government that you know about. Uh, if someone talked about this really strong case in an opening opposition, try to be the DPM or the DLO the other way around, rebut them, uh, et cetera. Uh, weigh your argument, <coughs> work with your partner. That, that way you're going to get yourself used to responding to really strong teams and to have to prioritize because they have a lot of content and therefore you cannot rebut everything. How to rebut a really strong team. If you manage to do that, you're probably going to be able to do that in other rounds. Uh, try to be a whip speech. Uh, this is not necessary, of course, if you are both DP, like deputy and extension, that makes sense. Uh, I do that too. But I guess that being a whip gives you structure onto like clash points and what are the most important things in a debate. And those are tools that are usually useful as a deputy too. Like you can structure your deputy in like panel at the end of this uh, debate, you're going to judge upon two metrics. The first one, X, X, the second one, Y. Why do we as opening opposition win on both? And then you start like delivering your speech. I guess that's something that works. And the best way to grow with the structure is to be a whip speech. It also helps you with priority prioritization. So I guess that's also particularly useful. Try to debate in big picture, meaning uh, do not take notes uh, and also deliver your speech without uh, note. I guess that's obvious still. Uh, because this way you are going to be able to develop skills when it comes to prioritizing uh, because you need to listen to what's the most important thing because you are probably not going to be able to remember everything that the other team is saying. And also, it helps with uh, like communication with your partner because you need uh, you cannot write things down. Uh, 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 so so I guess yes, it, it helps a lot. 
big picture debating is usually helpful just to not get used to it because notes are important but i guess uh yes this develops a certain skill that are useful also uh do like rebuttal drills again as, as i said in like the common mistakes sometimes we want to like completely crush and destroy the other team and respond to every single thing that they're saying we sometimes do not recognize that even when they gave like eight mechanisms onto why something that was uh, true, maybe the uh, from the third one to the eighth one, they were all dependent on the second one. So if you're rebut that, then uh, everything else falls apart. Therefore, we should only like rebut that mechanism. Or maybe one argument that they bring is definitely not converted because it's like fully symmetric. So why should you engage in proving why that is not true? Maybe you should only uh, briefly explain why that happens on both sides and then explain why the particular delta is on yours. Uh, so do a lot of rebuttal drills so that you know how to prioritize uh, rebuttals. And again, as I said, but uh, at the beginning, I guess, when I talked about strategy and I want to conclude with that, uh, works work both hard, like working hard is important, but also work smart be have clear goals and work work towards those goals particularly do not enter like every single tournament uh and assume that that is going to help because of course that is going to give you experience but uh if you are properly if you're not debating like with the proper form i'm going to draw an analogy with like a free throws in basketball uh, if you throw a hundred of them, but your your like your elbows are in like poor position, you are probably going to make some shots out of chance. You're probably going to win some debates out of chance, maybe because you're acquiring new mechanisms, you're getting used to debate, and that's going to be helpful. But the other, the only win which you can consistently know that you're effectively going to win, or at least not, or at least not lose, and you're always going to like add points, and you're consistently breaking is a point in which you know what you're doing, know what are your areas of, of opportunity and know how to work towards um, improving them. So work smart, know what your weaknesses are, work on them, the train and debate towards uh, eliminating them. And uh, I guess that's it. Also enjoy debate, I guess. Uh, when, whenever we train and we, when we have more competitive debating is not only for winning, those are also more engaging, more challenging, and therefore better for us because they push us, they, they push ourselves towards better version of ourselves, I guess, uh, more creative, more strategic, more uh, like uh, smarter versions of ourselves, I guess. And that's also really valuable. So yes, that's also something you should take into consideration. And that's it for me. Okay, do you want me to go first for this one? So um, the question is, common metrics are scale slash number of people or vulnerability of people. Are there any others that you think are useful? So this is a question of weighing. Um, the, the, the irony of this question is I often get made fun of a lot for using the same weighing metrics. However, I think the question, um, speaks to uh so i will identify a few more but i think the thing that's really important when you're weighing is to kind of not just throw out the mechanism but obviously just to explain why it actually does meaningfully link um so a few other ways that i weigh are often just on sort of the intensity of impact so it might be that uh their side affects a lot of people but it does so in a way that doesn't meaningfully change their life so the way i would think of it is the way that you can conceptualize it perhaps is maybe they are giving a hundred people $1 each, but that $1 is not going to really meaningfully do much to change their lives. Whereas we're giving people 10 people 
$10 and that actually will make a meaningful difference to the way that they might spend their money or something like that. So that's kind of the way that I would conceptualize it. But in order to make that metric work, you have to explain uh, why that is actually the case and why that, the, you know, the, the intensity of which they are impacted is actually more meaningful than the, uh, for example, the numerous more people that might be affected on the other side of the bench. So that is one. Uh, another is just uh, sort of on the, the way in which the impact might be something that is more certain than others in the debate um, is one that I use a fair bit. Um, I think, though, again, it's important to actually explain why that's the case rather than just saying ah, our impact is more certain. Explain why that's the case. Maybe the other side's impact is reliant on, um, you know, X, Y, and Z changes happening, whereas yours is just reliant on X change happening. Therefore, it's a lot easier. Um, maybe your change bypasses a certain group of people and then that makes it more plausible. Or maybe it's not reliant on kind of like large scale political change. It's reliant on uh, more, you know, internal community change. So that was, for example, I think something that might have been applicable to the I think it was round three motion. I guess a lot of people might have talked about political changes, maybe a closing the way to kind of frame that out was to talk about more certain but less wide scale community level buy-in or something like that. Uh, the other one that comes to mind, um, although uh, this can kind of be similar to like scale and things about explaining in a slightly different mannerism is, uh, explaining why your impact might occur over a much period of time. Um, so perhaps, again, the you know if we're talking about political cycles, maybe one team's impact applies in a very short period of time. Yours applies over a number of decades. Therefore, it's kind of, in a way, impacting more people, but not necessarily in terms of immediate impact of scale, but in terms of time duration. One final thing that I often uh, will do is to try to frame material as so, so if you're having a principled claim in the debate, you can often just explain why this is very important and kind of bypasses any practical considerations. But I think you obviously need to do some work there to explain why um, that practical consideration, sorry, why that principled argumentation is, uh, as they say, not in fact uh, contingent on any sort of practical outcome. So often, for example, we make principled arguments about having a duty to help a group, but then that ends up getting resolved um, like by how we best help that group. So if you can kind of explain why something applies in and of itself, that's not so much a weighing mechanism, but something that I think can help position the principle to bypass practical considerations in the debate. So those are a few. Um, Benjamin, is there anything else you wanted to add? I don't think so. I guess you covered uh, everything I was going to say. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can uh, uh, answer the second question then. Uh, okay, so the question is, um, how do you advise deputy speeches balance their time between rebutting the other top half team and trying to preempt closing? Um, I would say, of course, this depends on maybe the, the room. Like this is also something that uh, teams recommend, which is like know what teams are in your round, know the, like your judge and what they value um etc so i guess if you know that a particular team is going to bring this particular argument or you know like they are the strong team in the room you maybe should like prioritize that uh, although that's risky but still like i guess that's that's one thing if the like the strong team's closing opposition not opening opposition and you're already like uh covered enough like uh the responses from opening up uh, opening opposition then you can preemptively respond uh, if there are weak responses from opening opposition, uh, then you can explicitly stay like, uh, notice how this response is not correct. Maybe a more competent response would be this one. Uh, this still is not enough because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, and that way you are like making the judges see that that's not enough, but that you're still responding to uh, like uh, a complete, uh, like a more complete response, I guess. So uh, that should also work. Um, accept POIs from uh, like from the get-go from the prime minister or from the leader of opposition just to know how what they are going to bring because they might uh, look similar 
you can also be explicit uh, on this like plugin saying, notice how both the positions are going to talk about uh, the short term. The short term is not as important as development because of this reason. You can like also force them like to play or, or, or like to make sure or to create a narrative in the minds of the panel that they are covering the same issues and that you've already preemptively responded to that. Also, if you like weigh your arguments like separately, I guess this does not make a lot of sense because you need to do that like based on the round. But if you explicitly state why what you're saying is the most important thing and why is like security or like privacy, whatever, the most important thing in the round, uh, you're also like preemptively responding because the, 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 the other team would need to bring more characterization or more wing to prove that that is not correct, but you're also responding at the same time to opening up a situation. Uh, and I guess like the most basic response, but uh, still is um, just listen to, <coughs> uh, to, to what the like, opening opposition is saying, like or, or opening government or opening opposition. If they respond, if, if their response is actually like enough and they're doing like really competent work, you can try to, to then heavily prioritize that. And if they are doing that, then there is a chance that those are the strongest responses. That's the strongest case and that their closing is not going to bring a much different one or a better one. And if you're already beating them, uh, you're, you're, you're on, like blocking their impact, therefore you're probably going to uh, win to the closing as well. Um, but yes, those are like the general tips, I guess. Okay, great. Um, I might answer the, have a go at um, answering the next question then, um, which is how do you hedge against closing teams repeatedly claiming that you didn't prove your stuff in opening? This is when you've proven them to a reasonable degree, if not perfectly. Um, so maybe a couple of comments to make there. Um, one obviously uh, thing you can do is utilize POIs. Um, there is different degrees of consensus as to how those POIs should be framed. I think um, you could probably just POI your you know, diagonal to explain you know, we explained this, yada, yada, yada. So then you're kind of consciously reminding the judge that you in fact did. So hopefully the closing team behind you's assertion will not hold up. That's probably the more reasonable way to do it. I know there are some teams and I've been guilty of this in the past, um, which almost try to kind of like rebut my own closing via POI being like, um, you know, unlike CG's claim, we actually did in fact mechanize yada, yada, yada. Um, you can do that. Uh, there are some like strategic risks to that insofar as I think that kind of produces a bit more antagonism in the debate and then the determination of uh, your closing to kind of further straw man you. Um, so um, I think probably the safer bet most of the time is to just kind of utilize POIs to kind of remind the judge um, that you have in fact um, Something that you can also say, um, and I just want to make sure my internet's still okay here. Let me know if there are any issues because it's it comes and goes. Um, another thing you can do is just when you're making that, you know, those mechanistic claims in your speeches, um, and this is not without trade-off as well because it kind of buys into the same problem that I said before about kind of making your bench comparison a bit more antagonistic. Is you can sometimes use rhetorical devices like um, and. To be clear, we have fully mechanized this. So, you know, um, CG would not feel sort of burden.
can um okay back sorry so I think I don't know where I was up to but more or less what I was saying is I think it can be helpful to flag to the judge that you kind of fulfilled your burden of proof with respect to mechanizing a claim um I would caution against the extent to which you kind of again do the kind of increasing trend of um saying you know our closing is going to have to do a lot to extend over us or you know, POIing them, you know, POIing your diagonal team to just be like, ah, oh, CGs now, you know, um, claiming we didn't do X when we did, because sometimes it can kind of like, I think, um, you know, fuel the kind of perception that like you're being a bit too defensive of your case, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I think in short, I think utilizing POIs and just being very clear and explicit that you fulfilled your burden of proof in order to fit that, to prove a claim, I think um, probably does most of the time enough to, uh, you know, uh, hedge against back half. And of course, if you think there are judges that are not tracking this, you know, accurately, then um, obviously that's, you know, there's, there's only so much we can do about uh, bad judging, um, but obviously utilizing feedback and stuff to kind of, um, you know, leave comments on judges that you think have, in fact, um, falsely weighed back half material are probably the couple things that come to mind. Uh, Benjamin? Um, I maybe, aside from the POIs, uh, also explicitly stating how we see that your argument is proving what you're saying that is proving, like not only saying like I gave you seven reasons and I'm um, proving these, but also why see that what you're saying is actually effectively contributing with uh, like getting to that premise or like fulfilling that metric. Um, because if you explain how, like, uh, what is it doing, like, in the meta debate, I guess uh, that that doesn't that lessens the room for someone saying that you did not do that. So aside from everything that old was already stated, I guess that that's also like a particular tip. Uh, flag a lot, but again, that was already stated. But if you flag, then it's easier for the judges to say no, but that was already proven, and they gave five reasons and they enlisted them. Uh, if you do list, it's easier for people to to re remember stuff. So just a quick tip, uh, like enlist the things and your mechanism or your reasonings, and uh, I guess that's it. Okay. I think that's it then for um, today's uh, seminar. Hope everyone found it useful and best of luck for your remaining rounds at Worlds, debate teams and judges alike. Good luck.